Hello, I'm Carol Thompson, and I play Mrs. Warren in our production of Shaw's Mrs. Warren's Profession. Our play was to go up at uh, Actors Net of Bucks County, wonderful nonprofit in Morrisville, Pennsylvania. And because of the coronavirus, we aren't able to open. And so we've videotaped our play and hope that you'll be able to enjoy it that way and that you will consider supporting us in this crucial time uh, because we rely on our audience so much and we would appreciate any donation you could make uh, toward our, our theater. Thank you. Hi, I'm Leah Jeffers and I play Miss Vivi Warren, Mrs. Warren's daughter. Uh, Mrs. Warren's Profession is a very controversial show and even to modern audiences uh, it still contains a lot of rather controversial ideas. Um, in the 1890s, when the show was first written, it was banned from the London stage for eight years. Uh, and when, a few years after that, it was first performed in New York, uh, the entire cast was arrested uh, for their revolutionary and shocking portrayal of women's economic conditions um, and their frank discussions of topics like prostitution. Um, so even though the play may seem relatively circumspect in the way it deals with these issues, to our ears, um, when it was first written and performed, and even for a few decades after, it was considered thoroughly shocking. We hope that you will consider donating to the Actors Net of Bucks County and that you enjoy the show. I beg your pardon, uh, can you direct me to Hindhead View, uh, Mrs. Allison's? This is Mrs. Allison's. Uh, indeed. Uh, 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 perhaps, uh, uh, may I ask, are you Miss Vivi Warren? Yes. Oh, uh, I, uh, I'm afraid I appear intrusive. My name is Prade. <laughs> uh, uh, Prade, don't let me disturb you. Come in, Mr. Prade. Uh, Glad to see you. Uh, that's uh, very kind of you indeed, Miss Warren. Uh, has your mother arrived? Is she coming? Uh, did you not expect us? No. Oh, goodness me. Uh, I do hope I haven't mistaken the day. That, that would be just like me, you know. Uh, uh, your mother arranged that she was to come down from London, and I was to come over from Horsham to be introduced to you. Did she? <laughs> My mother is rather a trick of taking me by surprise to see how I behave myself while she's away, I suppose. I fancy I shall take my mother very much by surprise one of these days if she makes arrangements that concern me without consulting me beforehand. She hasn't come. I, I really am very sorry. Oh, it's not your fault, Mr. Prade, is it? <laughs> and I'm very glad you've come. You are the only one of my mother's friends I have ever asked her to bring to see me. Oh, now, goodness, that, that really is very, very good of you. <laughs> will you come indoors, or would you rather sit out here and talk? It will, it will be nicer out here, don't you think? Then I'll go and get you a chair. Oh, oh pray, pray, and allow me. Take care of your fingers. They're rather dodgy things, those chairs. <laughs> Oh, uh, do let me take the hard chair. I, I like hard chairs. So do I. Sit down, Mr. Prade. Yes. Uh, by the way, hadn't we better go to the station to, uh, to meet your mother? Why? She knows the way. I suppose she does. <laughs> ah. Do you know, you are just like what I expected. I do hope you are disposed to be friends with me. Why, thank you, my dear Miss Warren. Uh, thank you. Uh, goodness, uh, dear me. Uh, I, I'm so glad to see your mother hasn't spoiled you. How? Well, in making you too conventional. Uh, you see, my dear Miss Warren, uh, 
I am a born anarchist. I hate authority. It spoils relations between parent and child, uh, even between mother and daughter. Uh, I was always so afraid that your mother would strain her authority by making you very conventional. Uh, it's such a relief to find she hasn't. Oh, have I been behaving unconventionally? Oh, uh, no, uh, no, uh, pray no. Uh, uh, at least not uh, conventionally unconventionally, you understand. Uh, but it was so charming of you to say that you were disposed to be friends with me. You modern young ladies are splendid, perfectly splendid. Eh? Well, when I was your age, young men and women were afraid of each other. Uh, there was no good fellowship, nothing real, only gallantry copied from novels and as vulgar and affected as could be. Maidenly reserve, gentlemanly chivalry, always saying no when you meant yes. Simple purgatory for shy and sincere souls. <laughs> Yes, I imagine that must have been a frightful waste of time, especially women's time. Oh, a waste of life, a waste of everything. Oh, but things are improving. Do you know, I have been in a positive state of excitement about meeting you ever since your magnificent achievements at Cambridge, a thing unheard of in my day. Uh, it was uh, perfectly splendid of you tying with the third wrangler. Just the right place, you know. Uh, that first wrangler is always a, a morbid, dreamy sort of fellow in whom the thing is pushed to the length of a disease. It doesn't pay. I wouldn't do it again for the same money. But the same money? Yes, 50 pounds. <laughs> Perhaps you don't know how it was. Mrs. Latham, my tutor at Newnham, told my mother that I could distinguish myself in the mathematical tripos if I went in for it in earnest. The papers were full just then of Philippa Summers beating the senior wrangler. You remember about it, of course? Well, anyhow, she did, and nothing would please my mother but that I should do the same thing. I said flatly that it was not worth my while to face the grind, since I was not going in for teaching, but I offered to try for a fourth wrangler or thereabouts for 50 pounds, and she closed with me at that after a little bit of grumbling, and I was better than my bargain. But I wouldn't do it again for that. Two hundred pounds would have been nearer the mark. Lord bless me. That's a very practical way of looking at it. Did you expect to find me an unpractical person? Oh, but surely, uh, uh, sh surely it's practical to not only consider the work these honors cost, uh, but also the culture they bring. Culture? My dear Mr. Prade, do you know what the mathematical tripos means? It means grind, grind, grind for six to eight hours a day at mathematics and nothing but mathematics. I'm supposed to know something about science, but I know nothing except the mathematics it involves. I can make calculations for engineers, electricians, insurance companies, and so on, but I know next to nothing about engineering, electricity, or insurance. I hardly even know arithmetic well. Outside of mathematics, lawn tennis, eating, sleeping, cycling, and walking, I'm a more ignorant barbarian than any woman could possibly be who hadn't gone in for the tripos. Now you know the sort of perfectly splendid modern young lady I am. What a monstrous, wicked, rascally system. Uh, I knew it. I felt at once that it meant destroying all that makes womanhood beautiful. Oh, I don't object to it on that score in the least. I shall turn it to very good account, I assure you. Oh, in what way? I shall set up chambers in the city and work at actuarial calculations and conveyancing. Under cover of that, I shall do some law with one eye on the stock exchange all the time. I've come down here by myself to read law, not for a holiday as my mother imagines. I hate holidays. Why, you make my blood run cold. Are you to have no beauty, no, no romance in your life? Oh, I don't care for either, I assure you. You can't mean that. Oh, yes, I do. I like working and getting paid for it. When I'm tired of working, I like a comfortable chair, a cigar, a little whiskey, and a novel with a good detective story in it. I don't believe it. I'm an artist, and I, I can't believe it. I refuse to believe it. 
It's only that you have not yet discovered the wonderful world that art can open up to you. Oh, yes, I have. Last May, I spent six weeks in London with Honoria Fraser. Mama thought we were doing a round of sightseeing together, but really I was at Honoria's chambers in Chancery Lane, working away at actuarial calculations and helping her as well as a greenhorn could. In the evenings we smoked and talked and never dreamt of going out except for exercise. And I never enjoyed myself more in my life. I cleared all my expenses and got initiated into the business without a fee in the bargain. Bless my heart and soul, Miss Warren. You call that discovering art? Wait a bit. That wasn't the beginning. I went up to town on an invitation from some artistic people in Fitzjohn's Avenue. One of the girls was a Newnham chum. They took me to the National Gallery. Ah. And to the opera. Oh, good. And to a concert where ah. the band played all the evening, Beethoven and Wagner and so on. <laughs> I wouldn't go through that experience again for anything you could offer me. I held out for civility's sake until the third day, and then I said plump out that I couldn't stand it any longer, and I went off to Chancery Lane. Now that you know a bit more about me, how do you think I shall get on with my mother? Well, um, I, I, I hope that... Uh, it's not so much what you hope, Mr. Prade, as what you believe that I wish to know. Well, uh, frankly, Miss Warren, uh, I, I believe... Uh, your mother will be a little disappointed, uh, uh, not from any shortcoming on your part, you know. I, I don't mean that. But you are so very different from her ideal. Her what? Uh, her ideal. Do you mean her ideal of me? Yes. What on earth is it like? Uh, well, surely you must have observed, Miss Warren, that, that people who are dissatisfied with their own bringing up, generally think that the world would be all right if, if everyone were to be brought up quite differently. Uh, now, your mother's life has been, uh, well, uh, I suppose you know. <laughs> Don't suppose anything, Mr. Prade. I hardly know my mother. Since I was a child, I have lived in England, at school or at college, or with people paid to take charge of me. I have been boarded out all my life. My mother has lived in Brussels or Vienna and never let me go to her. I only see her when she visits England for a few days. I don't complain. It's been very pleasant. People have always been very kind to me and there has always been plenty of money to make things smooth. But don't imagine that I know anything about my mother. I know far less than you do. Well, in that case, uh... Oh, but what nonsense we are talking. Of course you and your mother will get on capitally. <laughs> Ah, oh, what a charming little place you have here. Rather a violent change of subject, Mr. Prade. Why won't my mother's life bear being talked about? Oh, you mustn't say that. Uh, but isn't it natural that I should have a certain delicacy in talking to my old friend's daughter about her behind her back? Uh, uh, you and she will have plenty of opportunity to talk about it when she comes. No, she won't talk about it either. However, I dare say you have good reasons for telling me nothing. Only mind this, Mr. Prade. I expect there will be a battle royal when my mother hears of my Chancery Lane project. I'm afraid there will. Well, I shall win, for I want nothing but my fare to London to start there tomorrow, earning my living by deviling for Honoria. Besides, I have no mysteries to keep up, and it seems she has. I will use that advantage over her if necessary. Uh, oh, no, no, pray, uh, pray you not do such a thing. Then tell me why not. I really cannot. I appeal to your good feeling, Miss Warren. Uh, besides, you may be too bold. Your mother is not to be trifled with when she's angry. <laughs> you can't frighten me, Mr. Prade. During that month at Chancery Lane, I had opportunities of taking the measure of one or two women very like my mother. You may back me to win. But if I hit harder in my ignorance than I need, remember it is you who refuse to enlighten me. Now let us drop the subject. Uh, uh, one word, Miss Warren. Uh, I had better tell you, uh, uh, it's rather difficult, but I think that... Uh... Here they are. <laughs> How do, Mater? Mr. Prade's been here this half hour waiting for you. Well, 
If you've been waiting, Praddy, it's your own fault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I thought you'd have the gumption to know I was coming by the 310 train. <laughs> uh, Vivi, put your hat on, dear. You'll get sunburned. <coughs> oh, forgot to introduce you. Sir George Crofts, my little Vivi. May I shake hands with a young lady whom I have known by reputation very long as the daughter of one of my eldest friends. If you like. Will you come indoors or shall I get a few more chairs? Yes. <coughs> well, what do you think of her, George? She has a powerful fist. Did you shake hands with her, Braid? Uh, yes, uh, it will pass off presently. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> oh, here, allow me. Uh, let Sir George help you with the chairs, dear. Here you are. You'd like um, some tea, wouldn't you? Oh, I'm dying for a drop to drink. I'll see about it. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> Just look at him, Praddy. He looks cheerful, don't he? <laughs> He's been worrying my life out these three years to have that little girl of mine shown to him, and now that I've done it, he's quite out of countenance. <laughs> Come, sit up, George, and take your stick out of your mouth. <laughs> I think, you know, uh, if you don't mind my saying so, that we had better get out of the habit of thinking of her as a little girl. Uh, she really has distinguished herself, you know, and, and I'm not sure from what I have seen of her that she is not older than any of us. Only oh, listen to him, George. Older than any of us. <laughs> well, she has been stuffing you nicely with her importance. <laughs> uh, but young people are particularly sensitive about being treated in that way. Yes, and young people have to have all that nonsense taken out of them, and a good deal more besides. Don't you interfere, Praddy. I know how to treat my own child as well as you do. What's the matter with him? What does he take it like that for? You're afraid of Preed. What? Me? Afraid of dear old Praddy? Why, a fly wouldn't be afraid of him. Yeah, well, you're afraid of him. I'll trouble you to mind your own business and not try and have your sulks on me. I'm not afraid of you, anyhow. If you can't make yourself agreeable, you'd better go home. Come, Praddy. I know it was only your tender heartedness. You're afraid I'll bully her. <laughs> My dear Kitty, <laughs> you think I am offended? Don't imagine that. Pray don't. Mm -hmm. But you know, I often notice things that escape you. And though you never do take my advice, <laughs> you sometimes admit afterwards that you ought to have taken it. Well, what do you notice now? Only that Vivi is a grown woman. <laughs> uh, pray, Kitty, treat her with every respect. <laughs> respect? <laughs> treat my own daughter with respect. <laughs> what next, pray? <laughs> Mother, will you come to my room before tea? Yes, dearie. <laughs> oh, don't be cross, Praddy. <laughs> I say, Pray, I want to ask you a particular question. Uh, yes, certainly. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. You might hear us through the window. Look here. Did Kitty ever tell you who that girl's father is? Uh, never. Have you any suspicion of whom it might be? None. Well, I know, of course, that you perhaps might feel obliged not to tell if she had told you. But it's very awkward to be uncertain about her now that we shall be meeting the girl every day. We don't exactly know how we ought to feel towards her. What difference can that make? We take her on her own merits. What does it matter who her father was? Then you know who he was. Uh, I said no just now. Did you not hear me? Now, now look here, Braid. I ask you as a particular favor. If you know, I mean, I only say if you know. You might at least set my mind at rest about her. Fact is, 
I feel attracted. What do you mean? Oh, don't, don't be alarmed. It's quite an innocent feeling. That's what puzzles me about it. Why, for all I know, I might be her father. For you? Impossible. And you know for certain that I'm not. Uh, I know nothing about it. I tell you any more than you do. Uh, but really, Cross? Oh, no. Uh, it's out of the question. That there's not the least resemblance. Oh, for that matter, there's no resemblance between her and her mother that I could see. Oh. I, I suppose she's not your daughter, is she? Really, Cross? Oh, no, 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 no offense, Fred. It's quite allowable, you know, as between two men of the world, you know. Now listen to me, my dear Cross. I have nothing to do with that side of Mrs. Warren's life and never had. She has never spoken to me about it, and of course I have never spoken to her about it. Uh, your delicacy will tell you that a, that a handsome woman needs some friends who are not, um, well, not on the same footing with her. The effect of her own beauty would become a torment to her if she uh, were not able to escape from it occasionally. Uh, you're probably on much more confidential terms with her than am I. Surely you could ask her the question yourself. I have asked her, often enough. But she's so determined to keep the child all to herself, she'd deny it ever had a father if she could. I am thoroughly uncomfortable about it, Fred. Well, as you are, at all events, old enough to be her father, I don't mind agreeing that, that we both regard Miss Vivi in a, in a parental way as a young girl who we are bound to protect and help. What do you say? I'm no older than you, if you come to that. Uh, yes, you are, my dear fellow. You were born old. I was born a boy, and I never have been able to feel the assurance of a grown-up man in my life. Paddy, George, tea! Ah, she's calling us. Why, <laughs> Frank Gardner, what on earth are you doing here? Oh, staying with my father. Ah, the Roman father. He is rector here. I'm living with my people this autumn for the sake of economy. Things came to a crisis in July. The Roman father had to pay my debts. <sighs> He's the only broken consequence. And so am I. Well, what are you up to in these parts? Do you know the people here? Yes, uh, I'm spending the day with a Miss Warren. Do you know Biddy? Isn't she a jolly girl? I'm teaching her to shoot with this. <laughs> I'm so glad she knows you. Yes, you're just the sort of fellow she ought to know. I'm an old friend of her mother's. Mrs. Warren brought me over to make her daughter's acquaintance. Oh. The mother? Is she here? Uh, yes, in inside at tea. Ah. Praddy, the tea cake will be cold. In a moment, uh, Mrs. Warren. I've just met a friend here. A what? A, a friend. Bring him in. All right. Uh, will you accept the invitation? Is that with his mother? Yes. By Jove, what a lark. Do you think she'll like me? I have no doubt you'll make yourself popular as usual. Uh, uh, come in and try. Oh, uh, stop a bit. <clears throat> I want to take you into my conference. Oh. Pray don't. It's just some fresh folly, but like that barmaid at Red Hill. It's ever so much more serious than that. You say you've only just met Phoebe for the first time. Yes. Then you can have no idea what a girl she is. Such character, such sense, <laughs> and her cleverness. Oh my eye, pray, but I can tell you, she is clever. And, need I add, she loves me. I say, Brady, what are you about? Oh, well, 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 do come along. Hello. Sort of chap that would take a prize at a dog show, ain't he? Who's he? Uh, Sir George Crofts, uh, an old friend of Mrs. Warren's. Uh, uh, come now, I think we'd better go in. Frank! Oh, hello. The Roman father. 
Yes, Governor, all right, presently. Look here, Braid, you'd better go into tea. I'll join you directly. Very good. Well, sir, who are your friends here, if I may ask? Uh, it's all right. Come in, Governor. Oh, no, sir. Not until I know whose garden I am entering. It's all right. It's Miss Warren's. Oh. Well, I have not seen her at church since she came. Of course not. She's a third wrangler, ever so intellectual. Took a higher degree than you did, so why should she go to hear you preach? Uh, don't be disrespectful, sir. It's all right. Nobody hears us. Yeah. I'm in. <clears throat> now, I want to introduce you to her. Do you remember the advice you gave me last July, Governor? Yes. I advise you to conquer your idleness and flippancy and work your way into an honorable profession and live on it, and not upon me. No. That's what you thought of afterwards. What you actually said was that since I had neither brains nor money, I'd better turn my good looks to account mm. by marrying someone with both. Well, look here. Miss Warren has brains. She can't deny that. Brains are not everything, sir. No, of course not. It is the money. I was not thinking of money, sir. I was speaking of higher things. A social position, for instance. I don't care a rap about that. But I do, sir. Well, nobody wants you to marry her. Anyhow, she has what amounts to a high Cambridge degree. And she seems to have as much money as she wants. <laughs> I greatly doubt whether she has as much money as you will want. Oh, come. I haven't been so very extravagant. I live ever so quietly. I don't drink. I don't bet. Much. Ha! And I never go regularly to the razzle-dazzle as you did when you were my age. Silence, sir! Silence! Well, you told me yourself, when I was making ever such an arse of myself about the barmaid at Redhill, huh? that you once offered a woman 50 pounds for the letter she wrote to her when you were ever... Frank, Frank, <laughs> for heaven's sakes! You are taking an ungentlemanly advantage of something I confided to you for your own good. To save you from an error you would have repented all your life long. Oh, take warning by your father's folly, sir, and don't make them an excuse for your own. Do you know the story of the Duke of Wellington and his letters? No, and I don't want to hear it. The old Iron Duke didn't throw away 50 pounds. He just wrote, Dear Jenny, publish, send me down. Yours affectionately, Wellington. Mm. That's what you should have done. Oh, Frank, my boy. When I wrote those letters, I put myself into that woman's power. And when I told you about them, I put myself, to some extent, I am sorry to say, in your power. She refused my money with these words, which I shall never forget. Knowledge is power, she said. And I never sell power. Oh, that was more than 20 years ago. And she has never made use of that power or caused me a moment's uneasiness. You're behaving worse to me than she ever did, Frank. Oh, yes, I dare say. Did you ever preach at her the way you preach at me every day? Oh, I leave you, sir. You are incorrigible. <laughs> I... Tell them I shan't be home to tea, will you, uh, now? Like a good fellow. Is that your father, Frank? I do so want to meet him. Certainly. God, now you're yes. wanted. Oh. Oh. Now, oh. my father, Miss Warren. Very glad to see you here, Mr. Gardner. Mother, come along, you're wanted. Ah. Let me introduce. Oh, why? It's Sam Gardner! <laughs> Gone into the church! Well, I never! Uh, don't you know our Sam? This is George Croft's large as life and twice as natural. <laughs> Don't you remember me? Yeah, I really... Uh, oh, I of don't... course you do. Why, I have a whole album of your letters still. I came across them only the other day. Uh, <laughs> Miss Vavasour, I... Nonsense. Mrs. Warren. Don't you see my daughter there? Oh. I don't know which
which is the worst of the country, the walking or the sitting at home with nothing to do. Uh, I could do with a whiskey and soda now very well. <laughs> if ever they had such a thing in this place. Perhaps Vivi's got some. Sense. What would a young girl like her be doing with such a thing? Well, you know, uh, never a... mind, it don't matter. Uh, I wonder how she passes her time here. I'd a good deal rather be in Vienna. Uh, Let me take you there. Ah, would you? I'm beginning to think you're a chip off the old block. Like the governor, eh? Never you mind. What do you know about such things? You're only a boy. <laughs> Do come to Vienna with me. It'd be ever such larks. No, thank you. Vienna is no place for you. At least not until you're a little older. Oh. 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 Now look here, little boy. I know you through and through by your likeness to your father, better than you know yourself. Don't you go taking any silly ideas into your head about me, do you hear? <laughs> Can't help it, my dear Mrs. Warren. It runs in the family. Oh! <clears throat> there, I shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> ah, I am wicked. <clears throat> Ah, oh, never you mind, my dear. It was only a motherly kiss. <clears throat> um, go and make love to Vivi. So I have. What? Vivi and I are ever such chums. What do you mean? Now, see here, I won't have any young scamp tampering with my little girl. I won't have it, do you hear? My dear Mrs. Warren, don't you be alarmed. My intentions are honourable, ever so honourable. Oh. And your little girl is jolly well able to take care of herself. Hmm. She don't need looking after her half so much as her mother. She ain't so handsome, you know. Oh, you have got a nice healthy two inches of cheek all over you. Oh, don't know where you got it, not from your father anyhow. Well, the gypsies, I suppose. Well, the broom squires are, are forwards. Shh, remember, you've had your warning. The perjury at the Winchester sizes is deplorable. Mm. Well, whatever became of you two? And where's Pratty and Vivi? Oh, they went up the hill. We went into the village. I, I wanted a drink. Well, she ought to go off like that without telling me. Uh, get your father a chair, Frank. Where are your manners? Uh, George, you can't stay here. Uh, where are you going to stay tonight? And, and what's Pratty going to do? Oh, God, no, no, <coughs> put me up. Well, no doubt you've taken care of yourself, but what about Paddy? Oh, I don't know. Suppose he could sleep at the inn. Hmm? Haven't you room for him, Sam? Hmm? Well, uh, you see, as rector here, I, I'm not free to do as I like. Uh, what is Mr. Prade's social position? Oh, he's all right. He's an architect. Oh. Hey, what an old stick in the mud you are, Sam. Yes, it's all right, Governor. You put that place down in Wales for the Duke. Carnarvon Castle, they call it. You must have heard of it. Oh, oh in that case, of course. Uh, we shall only be too pleased. Uh, he must know the Duke personally. Oh, ever so intimately. We can stick him in Georgina's old room. Yeah. Well, that's settled. Now, if those two would only come in and let us have supper. They've no right to stay out after dark like this. Oh, what harm are they doing you? Well, harm or not, I don't like it. Better not wait for them, Mrs. Warren. Pray, it will stay out as long as possible. Hmm. He has never known before what it is to stray over the heat on a summer night with my Vicky. Oh. I say, you don't come. Oh, Frank, once and for all, it's out of the question. You can ask Mrs. Warren. It's not to be thought of. Of course not. Is that so, Mrs. Warren? Well, I don't know, Sam. If the girl wants to get married, no good can come of keeping her unmarried. But, but, but married to him? Your daughter to my son? Only think, it's impossible. Of course it's impossible. Don't be a fool, Kitty. Why not? 
Isn't my daughter good enough for your son? Oh, but surely, my dear Mrs. Warren, you know the reasons. I know of no reasons. If you know of any, you can tell them to the lad or to the girl or to your congregation, if you like. Well, you know very well that I cannot tell anyone the reasons. But my boy will believe me when I tell him that they're all reasons. Hmm. Quite right, Dad, he will. But has your boy's conduct ever been influenced by your reasons? Uh, <laughs> well, you can't marry him, and, and that's all there is to it. Uh. What have you got to do with it, pray? Precisely what I was going to ask myself, in my own graceful fashion. Uh. Well, I suppose you don't want to marry the girl to a man younger than herself, and without either a profession or tuppence to keep her on. Eh? Hmm. Ask Sam if you don't believe me. Hmm. How much more money are you going to give him? <laughs> Not a penny. He spent the last of it, and he had his patrimony, and he spent the last of it in July. Hmm. Yeah, don't you. This is ever so mercenary. Do you suppose Miss Warren's going to marry for money? If we love one another... Thank I'd... you. Your love's a pretty cheap commodity, my lad. If you have no means of keeping a wife, that settles it. You can't have Vivi. Mm -hmm. hmm. What do you say, Governor? Eh? Uh, I agree with Mrs. Warren. Hmm. And good old Crops has already expressed his opinion. Look here, I want none of your cheek. <laughs> I'm ever so sorry to surprise you, Crops, but you allowed yourself the liberty of speaking to me like a father a moment ago. One father's enough, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Warren, I cannot give my Vivi up, even for your sake. <laughs> Young scamp. And, as you no doubt intend to hold out other prospects to her, I shall lose no time in placing my case before her. <clears throat> he either fears his fate too much, or his deserts are small, that dares not put it to the touch, to gain or lose it all. Uh. Wherever have you been, Vivi? Oh. On the hill. Well, you shouldn't go off like that. Without letting me know, how could I tell what had become of you? And night coming on, too. Now, about supper, we should be rather crowded in here, I'm afraid. Did you hear what I said, Vivi? Yes, Mother. Now, how many are we? One, two, three, four, five, six. Well, two will have to wait until the rest are through. Mrs. Allison only has plates and knives for four. Uh, it doesn't matter about me. Uh, I, I you have had a long walk and are hungry, Mr. Praed. You will have your supper at once. Now, I can wait myself, and I want one person to wait with me. Frank, are you hungry? Not the least in the world. Completely off my peck, in fact. Neither are you, George. You can wait. Oh, well, hang it. I've eaten nothing since tea time. Well, can't Sam do it? Would you starve, my poor father? Oh, allow me to speak for myself, sir. <clears throat> I'm perfectly willing to wait. There's no need. Only two are wanted. Hmm. Mr. Gardner, will you take my mother in? Of course. That's <laughs> Pass to that corner there, Mr. Fred. <laughs> Take care of your coat against the whitewash, that's right. Now, are you all comfortable? Uh, quite, thank you. Leave the door open, dear. Oh, Lord, what a draft. You'd better shut it, dearie. Got rid of them. Well, Bivens, what do you think of my gun? I've hardly spoken to him. He doesn't strike me as a particularly able person. Well, you know, he's, he's not altogether such a fool as he looks. You see, he was shoved into the church, rather, and in trying to live up to it, he makes a much bigger arse of himself than he really is. I don't dislike him as much as you might expect. He means well. How do you think you'll get on with him? Oh, I don't expect my future life will be much concerned with him, or with any of that old circle of my mother's, except perhaps pray. <sighs> what do you think of my mother? Really and truly? Yes, really and truly. Well, she's ever so jolly, 
But she's rather caution, isn't she? And crops. Oh, ah, crops. What a lot, Frank. What a crew. If I thought that I was like that, that I was going to be a waster, shifting along from one meal to the next with no purpose, no character, no grit in me, I'd open an artery and bleed to death without one moment's hesitation. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Why should they take any grind when they can afford not to? I wish I had their luck. No, what I object to is their form. It isn't a thing. It's slovenly, ever so slovenly. Do you think that your form will be any better when you're as old as Crofts if you don't work? Of course I do, ever so much better. Bivens mustn't lecture the little boys incorrigible. Uh, off with you. Bivens is not in a humour for petting her little boy this evening. How unkind. Be serious. I'm serious. Good. Let us talk learnedly, Miss Warren. Do you know that all the most advanced thinkers are agreed that half the diseases of modern civilization are due to starvation of the affections of the young? Now I, be You are very tiresome. Oh. Have you room for Frank in there? He's complaining of starvation. <sighs> Of course there is. Here, there's room now beside me. Come along, Mr. Frank. A little boy will be ever so even with his bibbons for this. <laughs> Bibby, here. Come on, child, you too. You must be famished. can't be done. You've eaten nothing. Is there anything wrong with you? Oh, I only wanted a drink. Well, I like enough to eat, but a little of that cold beef and cheese and lettuce goes a long way. <laughs> well, what you go encouraging that young pup for? Now, see here, George. What are you up to about that girl? I've been watching your way of looking at her. Remember, I know you and what your looks mean. No harm looking at her, is there? I'd put you out and pack you back to London pretty soon if I saw any of your nonsense. My girl's little finger is more to me than your whole body and soul. Oh, make your mind easy. The young pup has no more chance than you have. Well, may a man take an interest in a girl? Not a man like you. How old is she? Never you mind how old she is. Well, now, why do you go and make such a secret of it? Because I choose. Well, I'm not 50 yet, <laughs> and my property's as good as it ever was. Yes, because you're as stingy as you're vicious. And a baronet isn't to be picked up every day. Mm -hmm. No other man in my position would put up with you for a mother-in-law. Why shouldn't she marry me? You. We three could live together quite comfortably. I'd die before her and leave her a bouncing widow with plenty of money. Why not? It's been growing in my mind all the while I was walking with that fool inside there. Yes, it is the sort of thing that would grow in your mind. Look here, Kitty, you're a sensible woman. You needn't put on any moral airs. I'll ask no more questions and you need answer none. I'll settle the whole estate upon her. And if you want a check on the wedding day, well, you can name any figure you like within reason. So it's come to that with you, George, like all the other worn-out old creatures. Damn you! Oh. Oh, where's Sir George? Oh, gone out to have a pipe. Oh. Well, dearie, have you had a good supper? You know what Mrs. Allison's suppers are. <laughs> Poor Frank, was all the beef gone? Oh. Did you get nothing but bread and cheese oh. and ginger beer? Her butter is really awful. I must get some down from the stores. Do, in heaven's name. Ah, Frank, my boy, it's time for us to be thinking of home. Your mother still does not know yet that we have visitors. Mm. I'm afraid we may be giving trouble. Oh. Not the least in the world. My mother will be delighted to see you. She's a genuinely intellectual, artistic woman. Mm -hmm. And she sees nobody here from one year's end to another except the governor. So you can imagine how jolly dull it pans out for her. 
You're not intellectual or artistic, are you, Peter? No. So, take Pray home at once, and I'll stay here and entertain Mrs. Warren. <laughs> You'll pick up crops in the garden. It'll be excellent company for the bullpup. Uh, come with us, Frank. Uh, Mrs. Warren has not seen Miss Vivi for a very long time, and we have prevented them from having a moment together yet. Of course, I forgot. Ever so, thanks for reminding me. Perfect gentleman, Praddy. Always were. My ideal through life. Ah, if only you had been my father, instead of this unworthy old man. Oh, silence, sir, silence. You are profane. Oh, you should keep him in better order, Sam. Uh. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Here, take George his hat and stick with my compliments. <laughs> Good night. Ah, come along, sir. At once. <laughs> Goodbye, kid. Goodbye, Freddy. Here, I'll walk you to the garden gate. No, I hate you. Sorry. Good night, dear Mrs. Warren. Hear anyone rattle on so? Isn't he a tease? Now that I think of it, dearie, don't you go encouraging him. I'm sure he's a regular good for nothing. Yes, I'm afraid so. Poor Frank. I shall have to get rid of him, though he's not worth it. <laughs> That man Crofts does not feel seem to be good for much either, is he? What do you know of men, child, to speak that way of them? You'll have to make up your mind to see a good deal of Sir George Crofts, as he's a friend of mine. Why? Do you expect that we shall be much together? You and I, I mean. Well, of course, until you're married. You're not going back to college again. Do you think that my way of life would suit you? I doubt it. Your way of life? What do you mean? Has it really never occurred to you, Mother, that I have a way of life like other people? What, what's this nonsense you're trying to talk? Do you want to show your independence now that you're a great little person at school? Don't be a fool, child. That's all you have to say on the subject, is it, Mother? Don't you go on asking me questions like that. Hold your tongue. You and your own way of life, indeed. What next? <laughs> your way of life will be what I please, so it will. <laughs> I've been noticing these airs in you ever since you got that tripos, or whatever you call it. Well, if you think I'm going to put up with them, you're mistaken, and the sooner you find it out, the better. <sighs> All I've got to say on the subject, indeed. Do you know who you're speaking to, miss? No. Who are you? What are you? Oh, you young imp! Everybody knows my reputation, my social standing, and the profession I intend to pursue. What is that way of life which you invite me to share with you and Sir George Crofts, pray? <laughs> Take care. I shall do something I'll be sorry for after, and you too. Well, then let us drop the subject until you are better able to face it. You want some good walks and a little lawn tennis to set you up. You are shockingly out of condition. You weren't able to manage 20 yards uphill today without stopping to pant. Now don't begin to cry. I'll go out of the room if you do. Oh, my darling, how could you be so hard on me? 
have I no rights over you as a mother? Are you my mother? Am I your mother? Oh, Vivi! Then where are our relatives? My father, our family friends. You claim the rights of a mother, the right to call me fool and child, to speak to me as no woman in authority over me at college dared speak to me, the right to dictate my way of life and to force on me the acquaintance of a brute whom anyone can see to be the most vicious sort of man about town. Before I give myself the trouble to resist such claims, I may as well find out whether they have any real existence. No, no, stop, stop! I am your mother, I swear it. Oh, you can't mean to turn on me, my own child, it's not natural. You believe me, don't you? Say you believe me. Who was my father? You don't know what you're asking, I can't tell you. Oh yes, you can, if you like. I have the right to know, and you know very well that I have that right. You can refuse to tell me if you please, but if you do, you will see the last of me tomorrow morning. Oh, it's too horrible to hear you talk like that. You, you wouldn't, you, you couldn't leave me. Yes, without a moment's hesitation, if you trifle with me on this. How can I be sure that I might not, might not have the contaminated blood of that brutal waster in my veins? No, no! Oh, my oath, Vivi. It's not he, nor, nor any of the rest that you have ever met. I'm certain of that, at least. You are certain of that, at least? Ah. You mean that that is all you are certain of? Oh, now, don't do that. You know you don't feel it a bit, Mother. Well, that is enough for tonight. At what hour would you like breakfast? Is half past eight too early for you? My God, what sort of woman are you? The sort the world is mostly made of, I should hope. Otherwise, I don't understand how it gets its business done. Come. Pull yourself together. You're very That's rough with me, Vivi. Nonsense. What about bed? It's past ten. What's the use of my going to bed? Do you think I could sleep? Why not? I shall. You! You've no heart! No, I won't bear it. I won't put up with the injustice of it. What right have you to set yourself up above me like this? You boast of what you are to me, to me, who gave you a chance of being what you are. What chance had I? Shame on you for a bad daughter and a stuck-up prude. Don't think for a moment that I set myself up above you in any way. You attacked me with the conventional authority of a mother, and I defended myself with the conventional superiority of a respectable woman. Frankly, I am not going to stand any of your nonsense, and when you drop it, I will not expect you to stand any of mine. I will always respect your right to your own opinions and your own way of life. <laughs> my own opinions and my own way of life. <laughs> Listen to her talking. Do you think I was brought up like you? Able to pick and choose my own way of life? Do you think I did what I did because I liked it or thought it right or wouldn't rather go to college and have been a lady if I'd had the chance? Everybody has some choice, Mother. The poorest girl alive may not be able to choose between being Queen of England or Principal of Newnham. But she can choose between rag picking and flower selling according to her taste. People are always blaming circumstances for what they are. I don't believe in circumstances. The people who get on in this world are the people who get up and look for the circumstances they want. And if they can't find them, make them. Here, would you like to know what my circumstances were? Yes, you had better tell me. Oh. Won't you sit down? Oh, don't be afraid, I'll sit down. Do you know what your grandmother was? No. No, you don't. I do. She called herself a widow and had a fried fish shop down by the mint and kept herself and four daughters out of it. Two of us were sisters. That was me and Liz. We were both good looking and well made. I suppose our father was a well fed man. Mother pretended he was a gentleman, but I don't know. The other two were only half sisters. So, undersized, ugly, starved looking, hard working, honest, poor creatures. 
Liz and I would have half murdered them if Mother hadn't half murdered us to keep our hands off them. They were the respectable ones. Well, what did they get by their respectability? I'll tell you. One of them worked in a white lead factory, 12 hours a day for nine shillings a week until she died of lead poisoning. She only expected to get her hands a little paralyzed, but she died. The other was always held up to us as a model because she married a government laborer in the Deptford victualling yard and kept his room and the three children neat and tidy on 18 shillings a week until he took to drink. That was worth being respectable for, wasn't it? Did you and your sister think so? <laughs> Liz didn't, I can tell you. She had more spirit. We both went to a church school that was part of the ladylike airs we gave ourselves to be superior to the children that knew nothing and went nowhere. We stayed there until Liz went out one night and never came back. I know the head and mistress, the schoolmistress thought I'd soon follow her example, for the clergyman was always warning me that Liz would end up jumping off Waterloo Bridge. Poor fools, <laughs> that's all he knew about it. But I was more afraid of the white lead factory than I was of the river, and so would you have been in my place. <laughs> that clergyman got me a situation as scullery maid in a temperance restaurant where they sent out for anything you liked. Then I was a waitress, and then I went to the bar at Waterloo Station, 14 hours a day, serving drinks and washing glasses, for four shillings a week and my board. That was considered a great promotion for me. Well, one cold, wretched night, when I was so tired I could hardly keep myself awake. Who should come up for a half of scotch but Lizzie, in a long fur cloak, elegant and comfortable, with a lot of sovereigns in her purse. My aunt, Liz. Yes, and a very good aunt to have, too. She's living down at Winchester now, close to the cathedral, one of the most respectable ladies there. Chaperones girls at the county ball, if you please. <laughs> no river for Liz, thank you. <laughs> you remind me of Liz a little. She was always a first-rate businesswoman. <laughs> Saved money from the beginning. Never let herself look too like what she was. Never lost her head or threw away a chance. <laughs> when she saw I'd grown up good looking, she said to me across the bar, what are you doing there, you little fool, wearing out your health and your appearance for other people's profit? Liz was saving money then to take a house for herself in Brussels. And she thought we two could save faster than one. So she lent me some money and gave me a start. And I saved steadily and first paid her back and then went into business with her as her partner. Why shouldn't I have done it? The house in Brussels was real high class, a much better place for a woman to be in than the factory where my half-sister got poisoned. None of the girls was ever treated as I was treated in the scullery of that temperance place or the bar at Waterloo Station or at home. Would you have had me stay in them and become a worn out old drudge before I was 40? No, but why did you choose that business? Saving money and good management will succeed in any business. Yes, yeah, saving money. But where can a woman get the money to save in any other business? Could you save on four shillings a week and keep yourself dressed as well? Not you. Of course, if you're a plain woman and can't earn anything else, or if you've a turn for music or the stage or newspaper writing, that's different. But neither Liz nor I had any turn for such things at all. All we had was our appearance and our turn for pleasing men. Do you think we were such fools as to let other people trade in our good looks by employing us as shop girls or barmaids or waitresses when 
we could trade in them ourselves and get all the profits instead of starvation wages. <laughs> Not likely. <laughs> you are certainly quite justified on the business point of view. Yes, or any other point of view. What is any respectable girl brought up to do but to catch some rich man's fancy and get the benefit of his money by marrying him? As if a marriage ceremony could make any difference in the right and wrong of the thing. Ugh. The hypocrisy of the world makes me sick. Liz and I had to work and save and calculate just like other people. Elseways, we should have been as poor as any good-for-nothing, half-drunken waster of a woman who thinks her luck will last forever. <laughs> I despise such people. They've no character. And if there's a thing I hate in a woman, it's want of character. <laughs> Come now, Mother, frankly, isn't it part of what you call character in a woman that she should greatly dislike such a way of making money? <laughs> well, of course. Everybody dislikes having to work and make money, but we have to do it all the same. <laughs> I'm sure I've often pitied a poor girl, tired out and in low spirits, having to try and please some man that she doesn't care two straws for, some half-drunken fool who thinks he's making himself agreeable when he's teasing and worrying and disgusting a woman so that hardly any money could make her put up with it. But. She has to bear with disagreeables and take the rough with the smooth, just like a nurse in a hospital or anyone else. <laughs> it's not work any woman would do for pleasure. Goodness knows. Though to hear the pious people talk, you'd suppose it was a bed of roses. <laughs> Still, you consider it worthwhile. It pays. Of course it's worthwhile for a poor girl. It's far better than any other employment open to her. I always thought it oughtn't to be. It can't be right, Vivi, that there aren't better opportunities for women. I stick to that, it's wrong. But it's so, right or wrong. And a girl must make the best of it. But of course, it's not worthwhile for a lady. I mean, if you took to it, you'd be a fool. But I'd have been a fool if I took to anything else. Mother, suppose we were both as poor as you were in those wretched old days. Are you quite sure that you would not advise me to try the Waterloo Bar, or marry a labourer, or even go into the factory? Of course not! What sort of mother do you take me for? How could you keep your self-respect in such starvation and slavery? And what's a woman worth? What's life worth? worth without self-respect. Why am I independent and able to give my daughter a first-rate education when other women with just as good opportunities are in the gutter? Because I always knew how to respect myself and to control myself. Why is Liz looked up to in a cathedral town? The same reason. Where would we be now if we minded the clergyman's foolishness. <laughs> Scrubbing floors for one and sixpence a day with nothing to look forward to but the workhouse infirmary. <laughs> don't you be led astray by people who don't know the world, my girl. The only way for a woman to provide for herself decently is to be good to some man who's rich enough to be good to her. If she's in his own station of life, let her make him marry her. But if she's far beneath him, she can't expect it. And why should she? It wouldn't be for her own pleasure or her happiness. <laughs> Ask any lady in London society that has daughters, and she'll tell you the same. Only I'll tell you straight, and she'll tell you crooked. That's all the difference. <laughs> My dear mother, you are really a remarkable woman. You are stronger than all England. <laughs> And are you really not one wee bit doubtful or, or ashamed? Well, of course, dearie. It's only good manners to be ashamed of it. it, it it's expected from a woman. <laughs> Women have to pretend to feel a great deal that they don't feel. <laughs> Liz used to be angry with me for plumping out the truth about it. 
But then Liz was such a perfect lady. She had the true instinct of it. <laughs> well, I was always a bit of a vulgarian. <laughs> I used to be so pleased when you sent me your photos to see that you were growing up like Liz. You've just her ladylike, determined way. <laughs> oh, but I can't stand saying one thing when everyone knows I mean another. Oh, what's the use in such hypocrisy? <laughs> if the world is made one way for women, what's the use of pretending it's the other way? <laughs> nah, I never was a bit ashamed, really. <laughs> I consider that I had a right to be proud of how we managed everything so respectably and never had a word against us and how the girls were all so well taken care of. Some of them did very well. One of them married an ambassador. <laughs> but, of course, now we dare talk about such things. Whatever would people think of us? <laughs> oh, oh dear. I do believe I'm getting sleepy after all. I believe it is I who will not sleep tonight now, Mother. <sighs> Better let in some fresh air before we lock up. Oh, what a beautiful night. Look. Yes, dearie. Take care that you don't catch your death of cold in this night air. <laughs> nonsense. Ah, yes, everything I say is nonsense, according to you. <laughs> no, really, that is not so, Mother. You have got completely the better of me this evening, though I intended it to be the other way. <laughs> Let us be good friends now. Ah, so it has been the other way. <laughs> oh, I suppose I must give in to it. I always got the worst of it from Liz. Now I suppose it'll be the same with you. Well, never mind. Come, dear mother. Good night. I brought you up well, didn't I, dearie? You did. And you'll be good to your poor old mother for it, won't you? I will, dear. Um, blessings on my own deary darling. A mother's blessing. There's a time in each year that we always hold dear. Good old summer time. With the birds and the breezes and sweet scented breezes. Half past eleven. Nice hour for a rector to come down to breakfast. Uh, don't mock, Frank. Don't mock. I'm a little, uh... Well, Off colour? No, sir. Unwell this morning. Uh, where's your mother? <laughs> don't be alarmed. She's not here. Gone to town by the 11.13 with Bessie. Uh, she left several messages for you. Do you feel equal to receiving them now, or shall I wait till you've breakfasted? No, uh, I have breakfasted, sir. I'm surprised that your mother going to town when we have people staying with us. They'll, they'll think it very strange. Possibly she has considered that, at all events, if Groffs is going to stay here, and you're going to sit up every night with him until four, recalling the incidents of your fiery youth, it is clearly my mother's duty as a prudent housekeeper to go up to the stores and order a barrel of whiskey and a few hundred siphons. <laughs> well, well, I did not observe that Sir George drank excessively. You are not in a condition to, Governor. Do you mean to say that I... I never saw a beneficed clergyman less sober. The anecdotes you told about your past career were so awful that I really don't think Prey would have passed a night under your roof. If it hadn't been for the way my mother and he took to one another... Oh, nonsense. Uh, 
I am Sir George Croft's host. I must talk to him about something. Uh, and he only has one subject. Uh, uh, where's Mr. Prade now? He is driving my mother and Bessie to the station. Ah, is Crofts up yet? Oh, long ago. He hasn't turned a hair. He's in much better practice than you. Kept it up ever since, probably. He's taken himself off somewhere to smoke. Uh, uh, Frank. Yes? Uh, do you think the Warrens will expect to be invited here after yesterday afternoon? They've been asked already. What? Cross informed us at breakfast that you told him to bring Mrs. Warren and Vivi over here today and to invite them to make this house their home. My mother then found she must go to town by the 11.13 train. But I never gave any such invitation. I, I, I never thought of such a thing. How do you know, Governor? What you said and thought last night? Oh, I... Good morning. Oh, good morning. Oh, I must apologize for not having met you at breakfast, Mr. Prade. I, I have a, a touch of the... Uh, Benjamin sore throat, Yes, mate. yes. Fortunately, not chronic. Well, I must say, your house is in a charming spot here. A really most charming. Oh, yes. Uh, yes, it is indeed. Uh, oh, Frank, can take you for a walk if you like, Mr. Prade. Uh, I will ask you to excuse me. I must uh, take the opportunity to write my sermon while Miss Gardner is away, and uh, you all amuse yourselves. Oh, you won't mind, will you, Mr. Uh, uh, certainly not. Uh, don't stand on the slightest ceremony with me. Oh, good. I, I'll just be right back here, OK? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Curious thing it must be, uh, writing a sermon every week. <laughs> Ever so curious, if he did it. He buys him. He's gone out for some soda water. Uh, my dear boy, I, I wish you were more respectful to your father. Uh, you know you can be so nice when you like. My dear Praddy, you forget that I have to live with the governor. When two people live together, it don't matter whether they're Father and son, or husband and wife, or brother and sister. They can't keep up the polite humbug that's so easy for ten minutes on an afternoon call. Now, the governor, who unites to many admirable domestic qualities, the irresoluteness of a sheep, and the pompousness and aggressiveness of a jackal. Uh, my dear Frank, uh, uh, pray, pray remember, he is your father. I give him due credit for that. But just imagine his selling cross to bring the horns over here today. He must have been ever so drunk. You know, my dear Patty, my mother wouldn't stand Mrs. Warren for a moment. Vivian mustn't come here until she's gone back to town. But your mother doesn't know anything about Mrs. Warren, does she? I don't know. Her journey to town looks as if she did. Not that my mother mind in the ordinary way. She was stuck like a brick to lots of women who had gotten into trouble. But they were all nice women. That's what makes the real difference. Now, Mrs. Warren, no doubt, has her merits. But she's ever so rowdy, and my mother simply wouldn't put up with her. Frank! So, Frank! Uh, Mrs. Warren and her daughter are coming across the, the heath with crops. I saw them from the study windows. What am I to say about your mother? Stick on your hat. And go out and say how delighted you are to see them, and that Frank's in the garden, and that our mother and Bessie have been called to the bedside of a sick relative, and we're ever so sorry they couldn't stop, and that you hope Mrs. Warren slept well, and, and, uh, say any blessed thing except the truth, and leave the rest to Providence. But how are we to get rid of them afterwards? Well, there's no time to think of that now. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, he's so impetuous. I don't know what to do with him, Mr. Prade. Now, off with you. Great and I'll stay here to give the thing an unpremeditated air. We must get the old girl back to town somehow, pray come. Honestly, dear Praddy, do you like seeing them together? Oh, uh, why not? Uh, make your flesh creep ever so little. That wicked old devil left every villainy under the sun, I'll swear. And Divvy, ugh. Hush, pray, they, they are coming. This is way. Look. She actually has her arm round the old woman's waist. It's her right arm. She began it. She's gone sentimental, by God. Oh, 
Now do you feel the creeps? Ever so delighted to see you, Mrs. Warren. This quiet old rectory garden becomes you perfectly. Oh, uh, Will, I never. Did you hear that, George? <laughs> he says I look well in a quiet old rectory garden. Oh, oh you look well everywhere, Mrs. Warren. <laughs> Bravo, Governor. <laughs> now look here. Let's have a treat before lunch. First, let's see the church. Everyone has to do that. It's a regular 13th century church, you know, but the governor's ever so fond of it because he got him a restoration fund and had it completely rebuilt six years ago. Prayed we'll be able to show its points. Uh, certainly, uh, if the restoration has left any to show. Oh, I shall be pleased, I'm sure, if Sir George and Mrs. Warren really like it. Oh, come on and... Get it over. Oh, I have no objection. Oh, oh not that way. Uh, we go through the fields, yeah. uh, if you don't mind. Uh, round here. <laughs> Ain't you coming? No. I want to give you a warning, Frank. You were making fun of my mother just then when you said that about the rectory garden. That is barred in the future. Please treat my mother with as much respect as you treat your own. My dear Viv, she wouldn't appreciate it. The two cases require different treatment. But what on earth has happened to you? Last night we were perfectly agreed as to your mother and her set. This morning I find you attitudinizing sentimentally with your arm around your parents' waist. Attitudinizing? But that was how it struck me. First time I ever saw you do a second-rate thing. <laughs> yes, Frank, there has been a change, but I don't think it a change for the worse. Yesterday I was a little prig. And today? Today I know my mother better than you do. Heaven forbid. What do you mean? <sighs> Viv, there's a Freemasonry among thoroughly immoral people that you know nothing of. You've too much character. That's the bond between your mother and me. That's why I know her better than you'll ever know her. You are wrong. You know nothing about her. If you knew the circumstances against which my mother had to struggle... I should know why she is what she is, shouldn't I? What difference would that make? Circumstances or no circumstances, Bib. You won't be able to stand your mother. Why not? Because she's an old wretch, Bib. If I ever see you put your arm around her waist in my presence again, I'll shoot myself there and then as a protest against an exhibition which revolts me. Must I choose between dropping your acquaintance and dropping my mother's? <laughs> that would put the old lady at ever such a disadvantage. No, if, if your infatuated little boy will have to stick to you in any case. But he's all the more anxious that you shouldn't make mistakes. It's no use, Viv. Your mother's impossible. She may be a good sort, but she's a bad lot. A very bad lot. Frank. Is she to be deserted by the world because she's what you call a bad lot? Has she no right to live? <laughs> Oh, no fear that, Viv. She won't ever be deserted. But I am to desert her, I suppose. Mustn't go live with her. Little family group of mother and daughter wouldn't be a success. Spoil our little group. What little group? The babes in the wood. Vivi and little Frank. Let's go and get covered up with leaves. <sighs> Fast asleep. Hand in hand, under the trees. The wise little girl with her silly little boy. The dear little boy with his dowdy little girl. Oh, ever so peaceful. And free from the imbecility of the little boy's father and the questionableness of the little girl's mother. Shh, shh, shh. Little girl wants to forget all about her mother. Oh, what a pair of fools we are. <laughs> Come, sit up. Gracious, your hair. I 
one to do all grown up people play in that childish way when nobody is looking. I never did it when I was a child. Neither did I. You are my first playmate. Damn. Why damn, dear? Shh. Is this brute cross? <clears throat> May I have a few words with you, Miss Vivi? Certainly. <clears throat> You'll excuse me, Gardner. They're waiting for you in the church, if you don't mind. Anything to oblige you, Crofts, except church. If you should happen to want me, Vivens, ring the gate bell. Pleasant young fellow, that Miss Vivi. Pity he has no money. Do you think so? Well, what's it to do? No profession, no property. What's it good for? I realize his disadvantages, Sir George. Oh, well, it's not that, but while we're in this world, we're in it, eh? And money's money, you know. <clears throat> nice day, isn't it? Very. Oh, well, that's not what I came to say. Now, listen, Miss Vivi. I am quite aware that I am not a young ladies' man. Indeed, Sir George. No, and to tell you the honest truth, I don't want to be either. But when I say a thing, I mean it. And when I feel a sentiment, I feel it in earnest. And what I value, I pay hard money for. That's the sort of man I am. It does you great credit, I'm sure. Oh, well, now, I don't mean to praise myself. I have my faults. Heaven knows no one's more sensible of that than I am. I know I'm not perfect, but that's one of the advantages of being a uh, middle-aged man, for I'm not a young man, and I know it. But my code is a simple one, and I think a good one. Honesty between man and man. Fidelity between man and woman. No cant about this religion or that religion, but an honest belief that things are making for the good on the whole. A power not ourselves that makes for righteousness, eh? Oh, certainly not ourselves, of course. <laughs> you understand what I mean. <laughs> well, now as to practical matters. You may have an idea that I've thrown my money about, but I haven't. I'm richer today than when I first came into the property. I've used my knowledge of the world to invest my money in ways that other men have overlooked. And whatever else I may be, I am a safe bet from the money point of view. It's very kind of you to tell me all this. Now come now, Miss Vivi, you needn't pretend you don't see what I'm driving at. I want to settle down with a Lady Crofts, hmm? No, I suppose you think me very bold, eh? <laughs> Not at all. In fact, I'm quite obliged to you for being so definite and businesslike. I quite appreciate the offer, the money, the position, Lady Crofts, and so on. But I think I will say no if you don't mind. I'd rather not. Oh, well, I'm in no hurry. <laughs> it was only just to let you know in case young Gardner there tried to trap you. Let's leave the question open. Eh? My no is final. I won't go back from it. <laughs> I'm a good deal older than you. Twenty-five years. Quarter of a century. Shan't live forever, you know. And I shall see to it that you're well off when I'm gone. I am proof against even that inducement, Sir George. Don't you think you'd better take your answer? There is not the slightest chance of my altering it. Oh, well, no matter. I could tell you a few things to make you change your mind soon enough, but I won't. I'd rather win you by honest affection. Eh? <laughs> I've been a good friend to your mother. You ask her whether I haven't. She'd have never made the money to pay for your education if it hadn't been for my advice and help. Not to mention the money I advanced her. No other man would have stood by her as I have. I put not less than 40,000 pounds into it from first to last. 
Do you mean that you were my mother's business partner? Yes. Now think of all the trouble and uh, explanation it would save if we were to keep the whole thing uh, in the family, so to speak. Hmm? Ask your mother whether she'd like to explain all of her private affairs to a perfect stranger. I see no difficulty, since I understand the business is wound up and the money invested. Wound up? Wind up a business that's paying 35% in the worst years? Not very likely. Who told you that? Do you mean that it is still? What business are you talking about? Well, it's not what would be considered exactly a high-class business in my set. The uh, county set, you know. Oh, our set if you think better of my offer. Not that there's any mystery about it, don't think that. Of course, you know by your mother being in it that it's perfectly straight and honest. I've known her for many years, and I can say of her that she'd sooner cut off her hand than touch anything that wasn't what it ought to be. I can tell you all about it if you like. Hmm? I don't know if you've found in traveling how hard it is to find a really comfortable private hotel. Yes, go on. Well, that's all it is. Your mother's a genius at managing such things. We have two in Brussels, one in Ostend, one in Vienna, and two in Budapest. Of course, there are others in it besides ourselves, but we hold most of the capital, and your mother is indispensable as a ma managing director. <laughs> You've noticed, I dare say, that she travels a good deal. Hmm? Of course, you can't mention such things in society. Once let out the word hotel, and everybody thinks you keep a public house. <laughs> now, you wouldn't want people to think that of your mother, would you? Eh? That's why we've been so reserved about it. Oh, by the way, you'll keep this to yourself, won't you? Since it's been a secret so long, it had better remain so. And this is the business you invite me to join you in? Oh, no, my wife shan't be troubled with business. You'll not be in it any more than you've always been. I have always been? What do you mean? Only that you've always lived on it. It paid for your education and those clothes on your back. Now, don't turn your nose up at business, Miss Libby. Where would your Newnams and Girtons be without it? Take care. I know what this business is. Who told you? Your partner, my mother. Why, that Just oh. so. Well, she ought to have had more consideration for you. I'd never have told you. Oh, I think you probably would have told me when we were married. It would have been a convenient weapon to break me in with. I never intended that. On my word as a gentleman, I didn't. It does not matter. I hope you understand that when we leave here today, our acquaintance ceases. Why? Is it for helping your mother? My mother was a very poor woman who had no reasonable choice but to do as she did. You were a rich gentleman who did the same for the sake of 35%. You are a pretty common sort of scoundrel. That is what I think of you. <laughs> It don't hurt me, and it amuses you. Why the devil shouldn't I collect my money in that way, hmm? I take the interest on my capital like other people. Hope you don't think I've dirty my own hands with the work. Come now. You wouldn't refuse the acquaintance of my mother's cousin, the Duke of Belgravia, because some of the rents he gets are earned in queer ways. You wouldn't cut the Archbishop of Canterbury, I suppose, because the ecclesiastical commissioners have a few publicans and sinners among their tenants. Hmm? Do you remember your Crofts scholarship at Newnham? Well, that was founded by my brother, the MP. He gets his 22% out of a factory with 600 girls in it, and not one of them getting wages enough to live on. Now, how do you suppose they manage when they've no family to fall back on? Ask your mother. 
And you expect me to turn my back on 35% when everyone else is pocketing what they can like sensible men? Oh, no such fool. If you're going to pick and choose your acquaintances based on moral principles, well, you'd better clear out of this country. Unless you want to cut yourself out of all decent society. You might go on to point out that I myself never asked where the money I spent came from. I believe I am just as bad as you. Of course you are, and a very good thing, too. <laughs> what harm does it do, after all? Well, I suppose you don't think me such a scoundrel now that you come to think of it, eh? I have shared profits with you, and I admitted you just now to the familiarity of knowing what I think of you. Indeed you did. You won't find me such a bad sort. I don't go in for being super fine intellectually, but I've plenty of honest human feelings. And the crossbreed comes out in an instinctive hatred of anything low, which I'm sure you'll sympathize with me. Believe me, Miss Vivi, the world's not such a bad place as the croakers make out. So long as you don't go flying in the face of society, society doesn't ask any inconvenient questions. And it makes precious short work of the cads who do. There are no secrets better kept than the secrets everybody guesses. In the class of people I can introduce you to, no lady or gentleman would so far forget themselves as to discuss my business affairs or your mother's. No man can offer you a safer position. I suppose you really think you're getting on famously with me. Well, I like to flatter myself that you think better of me than you did. I hardly find you worth thinking about it all now. When I think about the society that tolerates you, and the laws that protect you, when I think about how helpless nine out of ten young girls would be in the hands of you and my mother, the unmentionable woman and her capitalist bully. Why, damn you! You need not, I feel, among the damned already. Do you think I'm going to put up with this from you, you young devil? Be quiet, someone will answer the gate bell. Will you have the rifle, then? Or shall I operate? Frank, have you been listening? Only for the bell, I assure you, so that you shouldn't have to wait. I think I show great insight into your character, Cross. For two pins, I take that gun away from you and break it over your head. Pray, don't. I'm ever so careless in handling firearms. Sure to be a fatal accident. With a reprimand from the coroner's jury for my negligence. Put the rifle away, Frank. It's quite unnecessary. Hmm. Quite right, Viv. Much more sportsmanlike to catch him in a trap. Crofts, there are 15 cartridges in the magazine here. Now I am a dead shot to the present distance, and an object of your size. Uh, you needn't be afraid. I'm not going to touch you. Ever so magnanimous of you under the circumstances, thank you. I'll just tell you this before I go. It may be of interest, since you two seem to be so fond of one another. Allow me, Mr. Frank, to introduce you to your half-sister, the eldest daughter of the Reverend Samuel Gardner. Miss Vivi, your half-brother. Good morning. You'll testify before the coroner that it's an accident, Vivi. By now, you may. Stop! Cow. Giving a little boy such a turn. Suppose it had gone off. Suppose it had. Do you think it would not have been a relief to have some sharp physical pain tearing through me? Take it ever so easy, dear Viv. Remember, even if the rifle scared that fellow into telling the truth for the first time in his life, that only makes us the babes in the woods in earnest. Come and be covered up with leaves again. Not that, not that. You make all my flesh creep. What's the matter? Goodbye. Stop, Viv! Viv! Where are you going to? Where shall we find you? At Honoria Fraser's chambers, 67 Chancery Lane. For the rest of my life. But I said, wait, dash it!
come in. It's not locked. What are you doing here? Waiting to see you. I've been here for hours. Is this the way you attend to your business? I've been away exactly 20 minutes for a cup of tea. How did you get in? The staff had not left when I arrived. He's gone to play cricket on Primrose Hill. Why don't you employ a woman and give your sex a chance? What have you come for? Biff, let's go and enjoy the Saturday half holiday somewhere, like the staff. What do you say to Richmond? And then the music hall and a jolly supper. Can't afford it. I will put in another six hours' work before I go to bed. Can't afford it, can't we? Aha. Look here, Viv. Gold. Gold. Where did you get it? Gambling, Viv. Gambling. Poker. It's meaner than stealing it. No, I'm not coming. My dear Viv, I, I want to talk to you ever so seriously. Very well. Sit down in Honoria's chair and talk here. I like ten minutes chat after tea. Well, ten minutes. I'll no see use grumbling. I'm inexorable. <sighs> Pass that cigar box, will you? Oh, nasty womanly habit. Nice men don't do it any longer. Yes, they object to the smell in the office and we've had to take to cigarettes, see? Well? Well, I want to know what you've done. What arrangements you've made. Everything is settled 20 minutes after I arrived here. Honoria has found the business too much for her this year, and so she was on the point of sending for me and proposing a partnership when I walked in and told her I hadn't a farthing in the world. I sent her off for a fortnight's holiday and installed myself. What happened at Hazelmere after I left? Nothing at all. I said you'd gone to town on particular business. Well? Well? Either they were too flabbergasted to say anything, or else Cross had prepared your mother. Anyhow, she didn't say anything, and Cross didn't say anything, and Praddy only stared. After tea, they all got up and went, and I have not seen them since. That's all right. Do you intend to stick in this confounded place? Yes. These past two days have given me back all my strength and self-possession. I will never take another holiday again as long as I live. <laughs> you look quite happy. And as hard as nails. Well, for me that I am. Look here, Viv. We must have an explanation. We parted the other day in a complete misunderstanding. Well, clear it up. You remember what Croft said? Yes. That revelation was supposed to bring about a complete change in the nature of our feeling for one another. It placed us on the footing of brother and sister. Yes. Have you ever had a brother? No. Then you don't know what being brother and sister feels like. Now, I have lots of sisters, and the fraternal feeling is quite familiar to me. I assure you, my feeling for you is not the least in the world like it. The girls will go their way, I will go mine. And we shan't care if we never see one another again. That's brother and sister. But as to you, I, I can't be easy if I have to pass a week without seeing you. That's not brother and sister. It's exactly what I felt an hour before Cross made his revelation. In short, dear Viv, it's love's young dream. The same feeling, Frank, that brought your father to my mother's feet, is that it? I very strongly object, Viv, to have my feelings compared to any which the Reverend Samuel is capable of harboring. And I object still more to a comparison of you to your mother. Besides, I don't believe the story. 
I have taxed my father with it, and obtained from him what I consider tantamount to a denial. What did he say? He said he was sure there must be some mistake. Do you believe him? I'm prepared to take his word against Croft's. Does it make any difference? I mean in your imagination or conscience, for of course it makes no real difference. Well, none whatever to me. Nor to me. This is ever so surprising. I thought our whole relations was altered in your imagination and conscience, as you put it. The moment those words out of that brute's muzzle. No, it wasn't that. I didn't believe him. I only wish I could. Eh? I think brother and sister would be a very suitable relation for us. You really mean that? Yes. It's the only relation I care for, even if we could afford any other. I mean that. My dear Viv, why didn't you say so before? I understand completely. Understand what? I'm not a fool in the ordinary sense. Only in the scriptural sense of doing all the things the wise man declared to be folly after trying them himself on the most extensive scale. I see I am no longer Vivim's little boy. Don't be alarmed. I shall never call you Vivim's again. At least until you get tired of your new little boy, whoever he may be. My new little boy? It must be a new little boy. Always happens that way, or no other way, in fact. None that you know of, fortunately for you. <laughs> Curse upon yon collar, where he be. It's prayed. He's going to Italy and wants to say goodbye. I asked him to call this afternoon. Go and let him in. We can continue our conversation after his departure for Italy. I'll stay him out. How are you, Praddy? Delighted to see you. Come in. How do you do, Miss Warren? I start in an hour from Holborn Viaduct. I wish I could persuade you to try Italy. What for? Why, to saturate yourself with beauty and romance, of course. <laughs> it's no use, Braid. Viv is a little Philistine. She is indifferent to my romance and insensible to my beauty. Mr. Prade, once and for all, there is no beauty and no romance in life for me. Life is what it is, and I am prepared to take it as it is. You will not say that if you come with me to Verona and then on to Venice. You will cry with delight at living in such a beautiful world. <laughs> this is most eloquent, Braddy. Keep it up. Oh, I assure you, I have cried, and I shall cry again, I hope, at fifty. Uh, but at your age, Miss Warren, you would not need to go so far as Verona. Uh, you would, uh, you would, your spirits would absolutely fly up at the mere sight of Ostend. You would be charmed by the, by the gaiety, the vivacity, the happy air of Brussels. Uh, What's the matter? Can you find no better example of your beauty and romance than Brussels to talk to me about? Well, of course, it's very different from Verona. Uh, I, I don't mean to suggest I'm for sure a moment... I'm sure the beauty and romance come to much the same in both places. Uh, uh, my dear Miss Warren, uh, uh, is there anything the matter? She finds your enthusiasm frivolous, Freddy. She's had ever such a serious call. Hold your tongue, Frank. Don't be silly. Well, you call this good manners, pray? Shall I take him away, Miss Warren? I, I feel sure we have disturbed you at your work. No. Sit down. I'm not ready to go back to work yet. <clears throat> You both think I have had an attack of nerves, not a bit of it. But there are two subjects I want dropped, if you don't mind. <clears throat> One of them is love's young dream, in any shape or form. The other is the gaiety and romance of life, especially Brussels. 
and the beauty of Ostend. You are welcome to any, <laughs> any illusions you may have left on the subject. I have none. If we three are to remain friends, I must be treated as a woman of business, permanently single and permanently unromantic. I also shall remain permanently single until you change your mind. Freddy, change the subject. Be eloquent about something else. I am afraid there is nothing else in the world I, I uh, can talk about. The gospel of art is the only one I can preach. And I know Miss Warren is a great devotee of the uh, uh, gospel of getting on, uh, but we can't discuss that without hurting your feelings, Frank, since you are determined not to get on. Uh, don't mind my feelings. Give me some improving advice, by all means. Have another try to make a successful man out of me, Vin. Come, let's have it all. Energy, thrift, foresight, self-respect, character. Don't you hate people who have no character, Viv? Stop. Stop. Let us have no more of that horrible cant. Mr. Prade, if there are really only those two Gospels in the world, we'd better all kill ourselves, for the same taint is in both, through and through. There's a touch of poetry about you today, Viv. It has hitherto been lacking. Oh, uh, my dear Frank, aren't you being a little unsympathetic? No, it's good for me. It keeps me from being sentimental. Checks your strong natural propensity that way, don't it? Yes, go on. Don't spare me. I was sentimental for one moment in my life. Beautifully sentimental by moonlight. Uh, I say, Viv, take care. Don't, don't give yourself away. Do you think that Mr. Prey does not know all about my mother? You had better have told me that morning, Mr. Prade. You are rather old-fashioned in your delicacies, after all. Well, surely it is you who are a little old-fashioned in your prejudices, Miss Warren. I feel bound to tell you, speaking as an artist and, and believing that the most intimate human relationships uh, are far above and beyond the scope of the law, that though I know your mother is an unmarried woman, I do not respect her any the less on that account. I respect her more. Hear, yeah, hear. Yeah. Is that all you know? Certainly that is all. Then neither of you know nothing. Your guesses are innocence itself compared with the truth. I hope not. I hope not, Miss Warren. Ooh. You are not making it easy for me to tell you. Well, certainly, if there is, if there is anything worse, th th that is, uh, anything else, uh, are you sure you are right to tell us, Miss Warren? I am sure that if I had the courage, I would spend the rest of my life in telling everybody, stamping and branding it into them until they felt their part in its abomination as I feel mine. There is nothing I despise more than a wicked convention that protects these things by forbidding a woman to mention them. And yet I can't tell you. Two infamous words that describe what my mother is are ringing in my ears and struggling on my tongue, but I can't utter them. The shame of them is too horrible for me. Here, let me draft your prospectus. Oh, she's mad. Do you hear this? Mad, come Pull yourself together. You shall see. Paid up capital. Not less than 40,000 pounds standing in the name of Sir George Crofts, baronet, chief shareholder. Premises in Brussels, Ostend, Vienna, and Budapest. Managing director. Mrs. Warren. And let us not forget her qualifications, those two words. There. Oh, no, don't read it. Don't.
<laughs> Viv, dear, that, that's all right. We understand. And we remain, as this leaves us at present, yours ever so devotedly. We are indeed, Miss Warren. And I declare, uh, you are the, the most splendidly courageous woman I have ever met in my life. Well, then, sir, if you don't want to, take it easy. Thank you. You can always depend on me for two things, not to cry and not to faint. I shall need much more courage than that when I tell my mother we have come to a parting of the ways. And now I must go into the next room for a moment to make myself neat again, if you don't mind. Uh, shall we go away? No, I'll be back presently, only for a moment. What an amazing revelation. And I am extremely disappointed in Crofts. I am indeed. I'm not in the least. I feel he's perfectly accounted for at last. What a face of for me, Pradia. I can't marry her now. Uh, Frank, let me tell you, Gardner, if you desert her now, you will behave most despicably. <laughs> oh, good old Praddy. Ever chivalrous. Uh, but you mistake. It's, it's not the moral aspect of the case. It's it's the money aspect. I really can't bring myself to touch the old woman's money now. Is that all you were going to marry on? What else? I haven't any money. Or the smallest turn for making it. If I were to marry Viv now, she would have to support me. And I would cost her more than I'm worth. But surely a clever and bright fellow like you can make something by your own brains. <laughs> Oh, yes. A little. I made all that yesterday, in an hour and a half. But I made it in a highly uh, speculative business. No, dear Praddy, even if Bessie and Georgina marry millionaires, and the governor dies after cutting them off with a shilling, I shall have only four hundred a year. <laughs> and he won't die until he's three score and ten. He hasn't originality enough. I shall be on short allowance for the next twenty years. <laughs> no short allowance of it, if I can help it. I'll withdraw gracefully and leave the field to the Gilded Youth of England. So that's settled. I shan't worry about it. I'll just leave her a little note after we've gone. She'll understand. Good fellow, Frank. I heartily beg your pardon. Uh, but must you never see her again? Never see her again? Hang it all, be reasonable. I shall come along as often as possible and be her brother. I could not understand the absurd consequences you romantic people expect from the most ordinary transactions. Oh, uh, would you mind answering the door? If it's a client, it will look more respectable than if I appeared. Uh, certainly. Mm. My dear Kitty, come in, come in. What? Uh, You're here, are you? Here and charmed to see you. You uh, come like a breath of spring. Oh, get out with your nonsense. Where's Vivi? Uh, Praddy, won't you see me, don't you think? Oh, my dear Kitty. Don't distress yourself. Why should she not? Oh, you never can see why not. You're too innocent. Mr. Frank, did she say anything to you? She must see you if you wait till she comes in. Why shouldn't I wait? My dear Mrs. Warren, suppose you were a sparrow. Ever so tiny and pretty sparrow hopping in the roadway. And you saw a steamroller coming in your direction. Would you wait for it? Don't 
bother me with your sparrows. What did she run away from Hazelmere like that for? I'm afraid she'll tell you if you rashly await her return. You want me to go away? <laughs> I always want you to stay, but I advise you to go away. What, you'll never see her again? Precisely. Oh, Praddy, don't let him be cruel to me. Oh, she'll be so angry if she sees I've been crying. Oh. You know that Praddy is the soul of kindness, Mrs. Warren. Praddy, what do you say? Go or stay? I, I really should be very sorry to cause any unnecessary pain, but I think but perhaps uh, you had better not wait. Uh, the fact is yes. that... Uh, Too late. She's coming. Don't tell her I've been crying. Well, dearie, so here you are at last. I'm glad you've come. I want to speak to you. Frank, you said you were going, I think. Yes. Uh, will you come with me, Mrs. Warren? Uh, what about a trip to Richmond? Down the theatre in the evening? There's safety in Richmond. No steamroller there. Nonsense, Frank. My mother will stay here. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps I'd uh, better go. We're disturbing you with your work. Mr. Prade, will you please take Frank away? Sit down, Mother. Uh, come, Frank. Uh, goodbye, Miss Vivi. Goodbye. A pleasant trip. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I, I hope so. Goodbye. You're never so much better at taking my advice. Bye, David. Goodbye. Goodbye, Kitty. Bye. Well, Kitty. Or what did you go away like that for without saying a word to me? How could you do such a thing? And what have you done to poor George? I wanted him to come with me, but he shuffled out of it. I could see he was quite afraid of you. Only fancy he wanted me not to come. As if I should be afraid of you, dearie. But of course I told him that it's all settled and comfortable between us and that we're on the best of terms. Maybe. What's the meaning of this? I got it from the bank this morning. It is my month's allowance. The bank sent it to me as usual the other day. I simply sent it back to be placed to your credit and asked them to send you the lodgement receipt. In future, I will support myself. Wasn't it enough? Oh, why didn't you tell me? I'll double it. I was intending to double it. Only let me know how much you want. You know very well that that has nothing to do with it. From this point, I will go my own way in my own business and you will go yours. Goodbye. Goodbye? Yes, goodbye. Come, don't let us make a useless scene. You understand perfectly. Sir George Crofts has told me the whole business. Oh, the silly old... Just so. Oh, he ought to have his tongue cut out. But I thought it was settled. You said you didn't mind. Excuse me. I do mind. But I explained. You explained how it came about. You did not tell me that it is still going on. Vivi, do you know how rich I am? Hmm? I have no doubt you are very rich. You don't know all that that means. You're too young. It means a new dress every day. It means theaters and balls every night. It, it means having the pick of all the gentlemen in Europe at your feet. It means a lovely house and plenty of servants. It means the choicest of eating and drinking. It means everything you like, everything you want, everything you can think of. And what are you here? A mere drudge, 
toiling and moiling early and late for your bare living and two cheap dresses a year. Think it over. Hmm? You're shocked, I know. I can enter into your feelings, and I think they do you credit. But trust me, nobody will blame you. You may take my word for that. I know what young girls are, and I know you'll think better of it when you've turned it over in your mind. So that's how it's done, is it, Mother? You must have said all that to many a young woman to have it so pat. What harm am I asking you to do? Vivi, listen to me. You don't understand. You were taught wrong on purpose. You don't know what the world is really like. Taught wrong on purpose? What do you mean? I mean that you're throwing away all your chances for nothing. You think people are what they pretend to be. That what you were taught at school and college to think right and proper is the way things really are. But it's not. It's only pretense to keep the cowardly, slavish, common run of people quiet. Do you want to find that out like other women when you're 40 and you've thrown yourself away and lost your chances? Or won't you take it in good time now from your mother that loves you and swears it's truth, gospel truth? Vivi, the big people, the clever people, the managing people, they all know it. They do as I do and think what I think. I know plenty of them. I know them to speak to, to introduce you to, to make friends of for you. I don't mean any harm. That's what you don't understand. Your head is full of ignorant ideas about me. What do the people that taught you know about life or about people like me? When, when did they ever meet me, or speak to me, or let anyone tell them about me, the fools? Would they ever have done anything for you if I hadn't paid them? Haven't I always told you I want you to be respectable? Haven't I brought you up to be respectable? And how can you keep it up? without my money and my influence and Lizzie's friends. Can't you see that you're cutting your own throat as well as breaking my heart in turning your back on me? I recognize the Croft's philosophy of life, Mother. I heard it all from him that day at the gardener's. Oh, you think I want to force that played out old sot on you? I don't, Vivi, on my oath, I don't. It would not matter if you did. Mother, you don't at all know the sort of person I am. I don't object to Crofts any more than to any other coarsely built man of his class. In fact, I rather admire him for being strong-minded enough to enjoy himself in his own way and make plenty of money instead of living the usual shooting, hunting, dining out, tailoring, loafing life of his set, merely because all the rest do it. <laughs> and I'm perfectly aware that if I'd been in the same circumstances as my Aunt Liz, I'd have done exactly what she did. I don't think I'm more prejudiced or straight-laced than you. I think I'm less. I'm certain I'm less sentimental. <laughs> and I know very well that fashionable morality is all a pretense. And that if I took your money and devoted the rest of my life to spending it fashionably, I could be as worthless and vicious as the silliest woman could possibly be without having a word said to me about it. But I don't want to be worthless. I shouldn't enjoy trotting about the park to advertise my dressmaker and carriage builder, or sitting bored at the opera to show off a shop window full of diamonds. But I have... Just a moment. I've not done. Tell me why you continue this business now that you are independent of it. Your sister, you told me, has left this all behind her. Why don't you do the same? Well, it's all very easy for Liz. She likes good society. 
and, and she has the air of being a lady. Imagine me in a cathedral town. Why, the rocks and the trees would find me out, even if I could stand the dullness of it. I must have work and excitement, or I should go melancholy mad. What else is there for me to do? The life suits me. I'm fit for it, and not for anything else. If I didn't do it, somebody else would, so I don't do any real harm by it. And then it brings in money, and I like making money. Oh, it's no use. I can't give it up, not for anybody. But what need you know about it? I'll never mention it. I'll keep Crofts away. I, I won't trouble you much. You see, I have to be constantly running about from one place to another. You'll be quit of me altogether when I die. No. I am my mother's daughter. I am like you. I must have work, and I must make more money than I spend. But my work is not your work, and my way is not your way. We must part. It will not make much difference. Rather than meeting for perhaps a few months in 20 years, we shall never meet, that is all. Vivi, I, I meant to be more with you, I did, indeed. It's no use, Mother. I am not to be changed by a few cheap tears and entreaties any more than you are, I dare say. You call a mother's tears cheap. They cost you nothing. And you ask me to give you the peace and quietness of my entire life in exchange for them. What use would my company be to you if you could get it? What have either of us in common that could make us happy together? We're mother and daughter. I want my daughter. I have a right to you. Who's to care for me when I'm old? Plenty of girls have taken to me like a daughter and cried at leaving me, but I let them all go because I had you to look forward to. I kept myself lonely for you. You've no right to turn on me now and refuse to do your duty as a daughter. My duty as a daughter? I thought we might come to that presently. Once and for all, Mother, you want a daughter, and Frank wants a wife. I do not want a mother, and I do not want a husband. I have spared neither Frank nor myself in sending him about his business. Do you think I will spare you? Oh, I know the sort you are. No mercy for yourself or anyone else. I know. My experience has done that for me anyhow. I can tell the pious, canting, hard, selfish woman when I meet her. Well, keep yourself to yourself. I don't want to. But listen to this. Do you know what I would do with you if you were a baby again? I, as sure as there's a heaven above us. Strangle me, perhaps? No. I'd bring you up to be a real daughter to me, and not the person you are with your pride and your prejudices and your college education that you stole from me. Yes, stole, deny it if you can. What else was it but stealing? I'd bring you up in my own house, I would. In one of your own houses. Oh, listen to her. Listen to how she spits on her mother's gray hairs. Oh, may you live to have your own daughter tear and trample on you as you have trampled on me. And you will, you will. No woman ever had luck with a mother's curse on her. I wish you wouldn't rant, mother. It only hardens me. Come, I suppose I am the only woman you ever had in your power that you did good to. Don't spoil it all now. Yes. Heaven forgive me. It's true. And you are the only one that ever turned on me. Oh, the injustice of it, the injustice, the injustice! Ah. 
I always wanted to be a good woman. I tried honest work. And I was slave driven until I cursed the day I ever heard of honest work. I was a good mother. And because I made my daughter a good woman, she turns me out as if I were a leper. Oh, if I only had my life to live over again, I'd talk to that lying clergyman in the school. From this time forth, so help me heaven in my last hour, I'll do wrong and nothing but wrong, and I'll prosper on it. Yes, it's good to choose your line and go through with it. If I had been you, mother, I might have done as you did, but I would not have lived one life and believed in another. You are a conventional woman at heart, and that's why I'm bidding you goodbye now. I am right, am I not? Right to throw away all my money? No. Right to get rid of you. I would be a fool not to, isn't that right? Well, yes, if you come to that, I suppose you are. But Lord help the world if everybody took to doing the right thing. And now, I'd better go than stay where I'm not wanted. Won't you shake hands? No, thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye, Frank. <laughs>